So welcome and thank you all so much for coming out this morning and no worries if you're just like drinking coffee and like vibing through this. This is very much a like vibe accepting talk. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a, a professor at Northwestern, but I really identify as a person who kind of walks between fields. Um, I'm not an expert in most of the fields that I walk between, but I'm able to kind of carry knowledge from one field to another. Um, so I'm going to definitely be talking about a lot of things today that I am not an, uh, like an expert or even particularly proficient in, uh, but I think that the ideas are kind of neat to, to cross-pollinate to cross with. So yeah, uh, where are we in this talk? Um, so this is my, my graph of strange loop. Um, these are two talks that I saw yesterday. Um, our keynote in the morning was very loop, uh, but not very strange. Um, Dancing with myself was both very strange and very loop. Um, so this talk today will be very strange, not terribly loop. So yeah. Um, what is this talk about? This talk is about uh, knowing things um, and building programs. Um, it's also about how we know things by building programs, um, and sometimes how we know things by building programming languages, uh, and sometimes so how we know things just by building languages themselves. Uh, and the best way to do that is with our friends, and so kind of talking about this as a, a social activity that we do together as a community. Um, I'll talk about this image over on the right later. So yeah, part one, uh, this is the like, semi-autobiographical part, um, when you accidentally a language. Um, so a little bit about me, this is my first time at Strange Loop. I'm super excited to be here, uh, especially up on a podium. And in, in March 3rd of 2020, um, I gave a keynote at Bang Bang Con West. If y'all haven't been to uh, Bang Bang Con, they're very relevant to this conference. Um, and we definitely had 100 unmasked people in an auditorium, um, and we were trying to be very COVID safe, so instead of shaking hands, we bumped feet. So that was kind of the level of like where we were in March 2020. Uh, that was the last time I was at a conference. Um, so that was a keynote, this is a keynote, and it has been a short 577 days of no conferencing in between those, although we did lots of online conferencing, which is great. Um, if you wanna see that unhinged keynote, if you're enjoying this unhinged keynote, you can also watch the one about Muppets. Um, I haven't also gotten to show my cat at, at this conference yet so far, which is rare for a conference in 2021, since my cat is Shar. Um, so about me, um, I'm a maker of many interesting things. So I made a language called Tracery that I'll be talking to you about today. Um, but I also do like a lot of generative art. Um, there was a generative art workshop earlier this week um, where apparently I got a call out. Um, but I do a lot of stuff with like P5, uh, with JavaScript, with Canvas. Um, I've gotten really into doing um, some kind of fun machine learned things with uh, being able to detect where your face is and then making cool generative masks that play with you. Um, I also do a ton of outreach stuff. So um, I'm like teaching is a fun tool in my bag that I do. Like I'm teaching for Northwestern. It's nice. They give me health care and they pay me really quite well. Um, but I'll always just like continue teaching wherever I am. Um, and so as part of that, uh, I do a lot of like AI outreach. So I have a motto that is bringing AI to the people that AI doesn't deserve. Um, so I consider again myself kind of as a carrier of knowledge. Um, and as a carrier of knowledge, you often have to kind of translate to the groups that you're going to. So I have a lot of different tools for different audiences. Um, the one at the bottom is uh, I recently gave a, a workshop to the, uh, an AI workshop to the theater department, where we were in fact writing real AI, we were in fact interacting with real AI, but they could still do that as like kind of advanced theater profession, like for professionals. And so this was like how I described AI to them. Um, the thing up at the top, I'm teaching a machine learning class, and this was me attempting to make a map of what machine learning is for my undergraduate students in CS. So you talk to different people in different ways. Um, so I do a lot of outreach stuff. So see me later if you'd like to get some of my zines or buttons or stickers or things. Um, but yeah, like as part of that job, I really spend a lot of time thinking like, okay, you know, I can search the Wikipedia definition of something, but I need to be able to communicate to a person who's not in that field what that thing really is. Like, and for them, like, what is this thing, what role is this thing gonna play in your life? How do I interact with this thing? Who is this thing? Um, but first, a little bit about tracery. So tracery, this is a language that I made. Um, it's a super, I really made it kind of accidentally for a class project. So the history of tracery, I think I've got, yeah. So the, the class project was, uh, I had a class project that was supposed to be a pencil and paper assignment, and I did it in JavaScript instead. Um, and I wanted to describe a Roman, uh, if anybody's seen a funny thing happen on the way to the forum, um, that's actually based on actual Roman plays um, of these sort, like, and uh, he was in love with a maid who it turned out was actually a senator who was secretly disguised as twins, and then it was his sister. Um, so that kind of like fractal storytelling, I was trying to describe that. And I uploaded it and uh, 
a lot of people started making really awesome tools for it. But the actual language itself is like next to trivial. Um, I was able to write it when I was just getting started in JavaScript. Um, and the thing is basically what tracery is, you have this uh, JSON object over to the left. Um, and you can see you have it's um, a context-free grammar and you have some terminal names and then you have, or you have some symbol names and you have some possible terminals for them. And you can see in a couple of these, let's see, yeah, so this is the one that I made to uh, generate strange loop greetings. Um, you have like activity, doing, like hashtag doing things to hashtag program adjective, hashtag programs, um, preventing ha uh, hackers from hashtag activity. So you've got like a recursive one in there. Um, so this is like fairly straightforward. You're just going to recursively expand that text and then look up the symbols that are in that text. Um, I've successfully taught this to third graders, so hopefully y'all will be catching up on it easily enough. Um, and that gives you kind of like an interesting possibility space of in a very small grammar um, saying hello to strange loop and uh, asking you what you did you what you did last night like um, debunking functional board games and uh, preventing hackers from programming insecure programming languages um, so yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been made with uh, tracery um, this was a thing that I made with tracery although this is running on cheap bots done quick which is uh, cheap bots done quick is a hosting site so open source stories. Um, I open source tracery. Um, yeah, I, I open sourced it free as in mattress. Um, if y'all are familiar with the term free as in beer, free as in speech uh, for open source, um, there are a couple of other options, including free as in mattress, um, where this is abandoned. It's probably full of bugs, but you're welcome to take it if it's, like, if it's useful to you. Um, there's free as in piano, where like, you're welcome to take this thing. It's probably extremely valuable, but there's no way you're actually going to get it set up. Um, and free as in puppy, where this is a wonderful thing that is given to you free, and it is going to be a lifetime of work. Um, so different kinds of, of free in free software. Tracy was definitely free as in mattress. So I uploaded it. Um, a person in London called uh, V. Buckingham um, made this really cool tool such that um, if you paste in your little JSON into their site um, and you log in with Twitter, you can say, yes, I would actually like to make strange loop greetings six times an hour for the end of, like, until the end of time, or maybe just once a year or once an hour or once a day. Um, and in fact, if somebody replies to me with the word strange loop, uh, I want to give them like a suggestion of a talk that they might want to go to. So you can have like, uh, with no programming other than making your JSON object, you can have a functioning Twitter bot. Uh, and roughly 16,000 people have made, or well, 16,000 Twitter bots by the last count, which was like two years ago uh, on that site. So lots of people like picked up that. This is one that I made. This is Lost Tesla. Um, this was based on an Elon Musk tweet about your Tesla coming to you even if it's, uh, if it's summoned, even if it's across the country, and I was on a road trip at the time. And so I thought about kind of the, the phenomenology of like this robot with wheels and its very small array of sensors, like trying to navigate across America and make sense of what it saw. Um, and so this is something where it just posts multiple times a day about kind of things that it's seeing on its road trip. Um, and I really, like, this was one of my first bots that really turned into poetry um, because it's a context-free grammar. And so it's just like smashing things together, but sometimes it doesn't realize that it's repeating things. Um, and so I leave a quiet town now, a silo, a silo, a silo. The sun is gone now, everything is gold. My sensors detect light. So that's just a poem from a robot. That's a poem from an, Anglo an accidental language that I made that's running in a program that I wrote uh, on some software from someone in London. Um, but there's a lot of these that kind of like felt like poetry to me. These are a couple of my favorites. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned before, everybody started making these really wonderful bots. Um, so these are just a couple of the examples. Um, over on the right are mostly like bots that people have made um, on cheap bots done quick. But I had also released it as a JavaScript library, and it started also getting ported to a bunch of other languages. So people started using it for all sorts of different things. Um, you can write programs that use it for a variety of different artistic or non-artistic purposes. Um, as long as you just, you know, you have some grammar that you think is going to generate text without using a lot of context, um, and you just kind of want a, a faucet of sad car poetry that you would like to run forever. So do you want a faucet of sad car poetry? Then tracery is for you. Um, the users started inventing all sorts of cool stuff. So this is a, a fun thing that happens when you get more users. Um, users will start talking to each other. So there's like a sort of network effect where users will come up with interesting techniques and show them to other users. So they started making like cool ASCII uh, emoji art. Um, it, one person made some, and then everybody else started like making interesting variations on it. Um, this was one of the most impressive ones. Somebody realized that, hey, you know what's text? SVG. 
Um, and so he started using Tracery to generate SVG art. Um, and V. Buckingham edited uh, Cheatbot's Tongue Quick to also have like a headless phantom thing so it could render SVG and then paste that up there. Um, so now you can like make these cool SVG artworks. Uh, the, the second one on the right is one that I made called um, Everyone's an AI if you're an AI too. It's a fan, uh, fan bot for a project that I like. Uh, and this is using quick draw data. So I actually turned, I took quick draw data from Google, um, which is human drawn images, turned that into a giant grammar, and then uploaded the giant grammar to Cheatbots Done Quick. Uh, so there's a lot of invention going on. Um, people also figured out that, hey, you know what, all, what is also hierarchical text code? Of course, SVG is code, but like, you can do all kinds of weird code tricks. Um, and so there's a lot of people doing um, sort of languages that feed into other languages, uh, using Tracery to generate scripts in other languages. So it's, Tracery is, in fact, uh, DJ to club in England. Uh, because somebody had an audiovisual programming language that they were making like cool club visuals, and if anybody has ever been to an algorave, algorave kind of stuff, um, and he used tracery to basically make components that could be mashed up in real time, um, and kind of surprise him with how they're put together. Um, and then, of course, what's also hierarchical text? Tracery grammars themselves. So you can make a tracery grammar that generates tracery grammars. Um, this is, in fact, not useful for a lot of things, but um, I made this thing called Campamanx with it. Um, let's see, do I have an image? Yeah. So these are a couple of languages. Um, so you can go to Canva Manx, it's still up, uh, and you can just like hit the refresh button to, uh, what it does is it generates um, syllables and constructions for words and a very simple grammar for how those words are put together into sentences. Um, so you have kind of like a little generative logic for how this tiny language um, could exist. It uses that generative uh, model to create a name for this country. Um, and then create a number of sort of songs or poems for that country. Um, so these are different songs of Liz's, for, for example. Um, people picked that up uh, in a really beautiful way as they started doing readings of these, uh, these languages. So I, I brought this to an open mic night and I read a poem very badly and then somebody who actually like specializes in reading poetry read it just so beautifully. Um, and so beautifully that I actually named the, the project Kamba Manx after that language that existed for only they, they rolled the language, the poems existed, then they refreshed the page and the language was gone. So this is a language that existed only for a fraction of a moment and all we have left is the, the memory of what this language was named. So I really like that sort of ephemerality. So yeah, Tracery itself been used by lots of folks. Um, I have a site called artbot.club if you wanna make bots. Um, I'm trying to make it into a social network for bot making, but it's, it turns out it's hard to make software. I don't know if y'all knew this. Um, <laughs> But you can at least go to artbot.club and you can, like, it's a, a pretty posh editor for editing tracery grammars. Um, and you can earn merit badges, uh, see me for your merit badges. All right, well, that was great. I accidentally made a programming language uh, to get out of doing a very small class assignment, for which I got 110%. Um, what about second bug free programming language? Um, so then I started like working on more programming languages. Um, the biggest one that I've gotten some funding for and to the shame of getting that funding have not actually finished shipping. Um, but Google did, uh, I worked on it with Google for a while um, uh, as a prototyping platform for the Google Assistant um, and they were kind enough to open source it. So you can search for Bottery Google uh, and find, find some links to kind of this version on the bottom right. Um, and this is a chat app about um, you having a kitten and it's kind of like tracery for finite state machines. Unfortunately, it's just a little too complicated for the same sort of like 16,000 third graders uh, to use. So that was, a, that was a disappointment. It turns out that like I couldn't model that so clearly in my mind that I could explain it to a third grader. Um, and it's kind of sometimes harder to set out to write a programming language than to just accidentally do it. Um, but, and this is what this talk is about today, you can accidentally have many deep thoughts about programming languages, um, especially if you're not formally trained in everything that sounds like a really deep thought. So part two, what is a language? Um, so I'm really, I didn't, I dropped out of CS in college. I never had uh, a useful like programming languages class to tell me actually what is a programming language. And I, I have some very earnest programming languages friends who are happy to tell me what a programming language is. Um, but I, I also follow this thing called prototype theory. So there's like this kind of idea of um, if you ever get into a conversation where you're like, is this an X or is this not an X? Uh, and you're trying to put the world into buckets. So these are, there's a bucket called programming languages and everything is either inside or outside of that bucket. Um, those are good conversations to have over beer and like fun to argue with people online, but they're wildly unproductive. Um, there's a really fun trick that I found. It's called prototype theory. 
which says that like things are not in or out of a bucket. They're only, uh, there is some prototypical example that you have in your mind and things are either far or close from that. So it's like, okay, Java is a programming language. Things are either far or close from Java and our programming language based on that distance. Uh, or maybe you have a couple of landmarks. So these are some things that are very chair and less chair, things that are not functional as chairs, things that are obviously not chairs but can function as chairs. So that's kind of like you're using a lens on things. Like, is it useful in this moment, in this context, to think about this thing as a chair? Um, so it allows you to ask like, useful stuff like, you know, if this is a programming language, like, what would the reserved keywords be in this language? You know, who is compiling or interpreting this language? Um, are there different targets that I'm compiling this to? Is this a different language if I send it to different targets? Um, and so there's a lot of formal properties you can say about languages, and I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, who, who here knows like, formal properties of languages? All right, fewer people than I actually expected for this conference. Um, but, you know, that's not my problem today. <laughs> um, you can do really amazing things with formal pro project logic, uh, program logic, uh, and I don't have the access to those tools. Um, and we could also say things like, okay, you know, we could fill in this, this grid of um, what are the, like, structure rebel, target rebel programming languages, what are the, like, purest programming languages, and we kind of, like, put programming languages there. Um, but I kind of really like just kind of thinking about this through the lens of, you know, who's programming this? Um, is the syntax even words? What, what is my syntax in this language? Like, what kind of thing is being described by these programs? Is it like everything in the world? Like, what is Java trying to describe to us? Um, it's trying to describe a particular form of very highly structured world, um, ideally where the world breaks down into classes fairly quickly. Um, and then, like, is this, like, is this a form? Is it kind of a flat form? Or am I like, composing things? Or am I transforming things? Like, what is going on in this language? What are my kind of unit operations? Um, and so as I'm teaching, so I teach intro programming, which is super, like, I'm learning a ton. Hopefully the students are as well, but that seems like a side effect. Um, I'm learning a lot about kind of like how I think about programming. And I've realized, so I've, I'm a big fan of this book over here, The Programmer's Brain, where it talks about like the cognitive science of programming. Like, okay, you have a program, and your human brain is actually very small. You have like very small working memory. You have like slightly larger short-term memory, and then you have quite large long-term memory, but it's impossible to get anything out of there. So how do you fit like a thousand line program into your brain, much less like a 10,000 line program or a million line program or a 10 million line program? Like how do, you, how do you fit that in your brain? And I often have to talk to students about like, they're feeling like, you know, they're looking at their first 15 line program and thinking, I can't fit this all in my brain, I must get a bigger brain. I say, no, that's not what we do as programmers. We all have tiny brains and we have tinier brains when we get stressed, this is fine. Um, we need actually these like cognitive tools to compress the world that we're thinking about into things that we can say like, all right, that 15 lines, that is a loop that sets this variable. Or by the end of this loop, I should find uh, the student who's traveled the further south. Or by the end of by the end of this function, I should have ordered a coffee. And I can, like, even if that's like a 50 line program to order coffee, I can kind of compress that in my head to, like, okay, this is just a single thing in my brain now that is, like, I have the ability to order coffee if I call this function. So these are just cognitive tools to make your tiny, stupid bag of meat able to comprehend vast universes, which is a neat trick. So, yeah, um, uh, general purpose programming languages are really neat because. Um, if you think about it, you're saying like, okay, here's a general purpose programming language. I have Java here. Um, I've told myself that Java can hold anything in the universe. It's general purpose. If the, if the thing exists in the universe or my imagination, I should be able to somehow fit that into Java. Um, and often, like, huh? <laughs> yep. Um, so there's no truly general purpose programming language, but you know, there are things that try to be more or less general. Um, but we're building a language to describe the world. So the things that like, you know, I use to describe programs to my students are actually like, we think about like, okay, you know, I've broken this, this room up into here's a speaker over here, that's a special kind of object. There's a whole bunch of chairs. Maybe I don't want to think about each individual chair, like my brain just can't process. There are a lot of chairs, um, or like each individual chair is like molecules. And so my brain compresses them to, okay, there's a bunch of chairs. Some number of those chairs are filled with people. Those people kind of fill this range of expectation. Um, and I can like give this talk while cognitively like turning y'all into a kind of understandable space in my head. And so like I really like thinking about like what are these like loops and if statements and functions and classes actually doing for us cognitively that we wanted to do in the real world, or maybe we have other ways to do in the real world. 
Um, so yeah, there's two ways to fit a program into your head. Um, you can have a smaller program. I guess the third way is to have a very cognitively compressed program. Um, you can have a smaller program, um, or you can have a smaller reality. This also works, um, where you're not trying to describe everything. Um, you maybe need a smaller set of cognitive tools. Maybe some tools are not no longer appropriate or necessary for this task. Um, so this is when we get into things like domain-specific languages. There's also a concept that I really like called little languages that was um, defined by this article in, I want to say, like 89 or so. Um, where it's basically somebody saying like, okay, we have these big languages, but we also have these like little we languages that are often like you have a UI that outputs this language, um, or you have just a tiny language that makes, that is like input for other programs. Uh, so think of all the times that you have written a regular expression inside of another language. So these are kind of like little microscopic languages that often embed themselves in larger situations. So you can have like languages embedded in languages, uh, and the smaller they are, the more happy they are to do that. Uh, tracery has, in fact, become a very good little language. Um, it's like there's no, it's, it's got no requirements, it's got no like expensive build process, it's just like literally just a scrap of JavaScript, and so people put it all over the place. So it's easy to just like tuck kind of, I made a version of tracery that fits in a tweet if you need a tweet length tracery. Um, you can just kind of tuck it anywhere. Um, it's, it's a very polite companion. Um, so yeah, it's kind of neat to think about like what is this programming language about? Like what is it to know something about this world that we're describing? Um, what cognitive tools do we need to make sense of this world? What parts of the world are fixed and what parts of this world exist only in runtime? Um, and then the other question we can also ask about like a world is like, okay, what would the programming language about this domain be? Like how would we describe this particular world of like, you know, what's the programming language for coffee? Like what are the unit operations on coffee? How would you make a programming language that like, greater than anything else describes what you believe is important about coffee. It's the morning, we all have our coffee. So yeah, uh, here's an example of a programming language. Um, who here sees the program in this? Yeah, one person. So this is a language called Inform7. Um, this is for doing interactive narrative, uh, and it was targeted at writers. Um, thing that I found with Tracery is even the people, so I have one user who made over 100 bots. They're by far my most prolific and famous user. Um, they have said multiple times, I am not a coder. Um, they won't use the raw JSON editor. They actually only use the, uh, the visual editor, because if they see like a, a, a crash or a semicolon, they're like, aha, programmer crap, not for me. Uh, and they know about, and I've seen that like strikingly often in users. This is a really neat thing. It's like, and there's there's no convinc convincing that I need to do to like all the people at the internet of like, no, no, semicolons aren't scary, um, JSON's not scary. It is. Um, and so this was a language that was developed for writers, uh, and you can see there's no scary bits in here. But this is a running program, because what Inform7 wants to describe about the world is it's kind of like for Zork-likes, if anybody played Zork in the way back days. Uh, like, there are rooms, there are things in the rooms, you can interact with those rooms, there are things which are said. Um, thing, things in this world are described by the sort of output that they make if you look at them. Um, there's no like model for this thing. It's just like this thing, like this room exists as a bag of ways to uh, describe this. And so you can do things like say, the apple is a room, a winding street in Rome with monkeys all abloom and salmon made of chrome. So that's a string that will be described uh, if you like ask about the apple. Uh, the window is a door. Um, the window is east of the apple. The window is west of the lake. The lady is wearing a chapel. It looks like a venomous snake. So these, this is all like valid syntax to describe a world in the way that they need to describe worlds. Um, and also, I just think it's a, just a fantastic. I won't read the whole thing, but like, there's a couple of other examples of Inform7 program at the, uh, uh, poetry at that link. Um, this is just some more tracery. You know, tracery, what it's about fundamentally is just things are made out of other things. So it's a context-free grammar. But that those things are kind of like embedded in a bunch of text. Uh, and so it's like text and some stuff that goes out and text and some stuff that goes out. And so your world is kind of made of things that need to expand and things that don't need to expand and then like ways that you would use language as a human. Um, so it's kind of very similar to like a markdown language in that way where it's uh, natural language and syntax are kind of playing on an even field because this thing is about natural language more than it's about sort of rigorous structure or programming. Um, this is another language that I've gotten to play around with in the past. This is called answer set solving or answer set programming. Um, it's kind of like a, a big, like a bigger prologue uh, that can do more powerful things. This is me attempting to encode what a murder mystery is. Uh, so I have to say like, okay, so it's, it's a general purpose programming language originally I think made to do mathematical proofs. Um, let's get it to generate a murder mystery. And so I can say things like, okay, there, in a murder mystery, some number of people are dead at the end. 
this is true of murder mysteries. Uh, some number of people are in love. Um, if you are in love with somebody else, this is what a love triangle is. If you are in a love triangle, then you hate someone. Uh, if you hate someone, you have a motive for murder. Um, and so this is like describing a world. And like, it's really fun to see the bugs in this because there are failures to describe parts of the world that I didn't know I had to describe. So um, somebody would attempt to kill themselves because they were in the love, so they loved themselves and they loved themselves, but they also loved themselves. And so they were very mad at themselves and they were gonna off themselves. <laughs> um, radical self-love. So yeah, there was a really great talk on this at, uh, at Strange Loop, uh, or Strange Loop, or possibly like a spin-off conference, um, Lambda Jam, I guess. Anyway, it's on the Strange Loop uh, video site, uh, which I've been like watching lots of videos to prep for this talk. Uh, this is about musical composition and like describing music as a language of composition. It's like you could describe music if you're sort of naive. It's like okay, here's a sequence of notes, and actually this is like works pr perfectly well as like a MIDI description language, like, okay, uh, music is a sequence of notes, the notes can be different pitches. This encodes a space that has lots of very bad music. Um, or it's very hard to kind of like find any point in that space and say like, okay, this is probably music, this is probably not music. Um, and so he thought to himself like, okay, okay, how would I as a musician describe music? And he describes it as a functional programming language uh, where motifs are generated and then processed and looped over and transformed and looped over again. Uh, and convoluted in exciting new ways and combined with each other in exciting new ways. It's a, it's a functional language. But he had this really great quote that like, I think was just kind of tossed off as he was talking. Uh, the basic tenet of domain-driven language is that a small change in domain terms should be a small change in code terms. Uh, this kind of reminded me of the Alan Kay thing of simple things should be simple and complex things should be possible. This idea that like, you know, okay, here's, what is the definition of a programming language that matters to me as, a, as an artist? It's like, okay, I can, small language, like small things in my mind are small programs, complicated things in my mind are complicated programs. Programs that are kind of close to each other should be related. Um, and I could say like, if I have a program here, then a lot of the programs around it should be related. And this is a distance kind of measured by things that matter to me. Um, so if you're familiar with vector encoding, this is the idea that you can take a, a bunch of information that is not spatially located, and you could say like, okay, it's not spatially located, but you do have distances between it. So I could say, okay, like I've got the meaning of uh, dog and puppy, and I think that those should be very close together. And puppy is actually quite different pu from either puppy or dog. It should be quite far away. So I can like spatially arrange these things in some n-dimensional cube, uh, and then you get a vector encoding out of that. And you end up getting actually quite different embeddings if you're looking at different information. Like different, there's a different thing that you care about. So maybe dog and puppy shouldn't be close together in pronunciation encodings. Uh, poppy and puppy should be close together, and dig and dog should be close together. Um, Alison Parrish has a lot of really good presentations on this where she, she figures out the, um, the space in between um, puppy and kitty, the vector interpolation of those two is committee. Uh, so that is like the relationship in this world where we care about pronunciation but not meaning. Um, so it's all about kind of context. There's no like right encoding. So yeah, um, I kind of already talked about domain specific and little languages, so I'll just skip that. So yeah, here is uh, a couple of different domain-specific languages to express music. Um, if you were a child in, in preschool, you may have seen both of these at some point. Um, and so they're both different encodings, and you can kind of think about like, okay, um, you know, what is, what is actually being encoded here? Like, this is a lot, like, Mary Had a Little Lamb is a phenomena that exists in the world. Um, it's not obligated to us to be representable in in code in any way, but we're gonna still try to take a snapshot of it and put it in code. Um, so the one on the left says like, okay, the, the important things about this are like uh, how long each note lasts um, and how many notes are kind of in a rhythmic section. Um, and also, you know, like what is the key of this? The one on the right says, uh, I don't actually think those are relevant to the user. I'm gonna drop those dimensions from my vector encoding space. I'm just like not gonna have those in my language because I don't think they're relevant to this four-year-old who's trying to play a piano. Um, all I care about is, you know, there is an encoding that says like this key maps to this letter and this is where you would put your fingers and so I'm gonna like, but you also still need to have the lyrics. So they could have this without the lyrics, but the lyrics are important to this kid. So this is like defining a programming language or defining an encoding is like declaring what you think is important to this user in this context. Um, this gets really interesting when you look at other musical encodings. So this is, oh, I, I must have covered up the, uh, this is, um, Tibetan Yang chants. 
Um, so this is Tibetan chanting music um, from, uh, I think, the library in London. Um, and this is like an encoding of like what's important about that music. And I certainly don't read any of this, um, but you can see that it's definitely a different thing that is available, like a different kind of data encoding that is available to you uh, in, in Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, people got really playful with this. Like, okay, how do I encode the things that matter to me about music? Um, and these were people who are already like completely expert in musical notation. They could have encoded anything they want that would fit into musical notation. This was not a, a proficiency thing. Um, but somebody like John Cage said, okay, you know, I, I want to express my music in a different way. There's a different encoding that I think is going to be more concise. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, to pander to this crowd, I've been programming in Java too long, and I want to program this in Haskell, because uh, I think I can be that much more elegant in it. Um, so he encoded this in kind of a drawing. Um, it's called ARIA. You can actually see people perform this, which is like a trip, because it's really interesting to see, OK, here's the program. What are the different ways that that program has been interpreted by different kind of hardware that it's running on? Um, this is another one. I'm a particular fan of Grapefruit by Yoko Ono. So this is a, a score for voice piece for soprano. Um, and like, what is encoded here? It's like the directionality. Uh, you're screaming, so she's encoding like what you're doing uh, and like a little suggestion of that. But it's like you never see in music like what am I like? Is the assumption that I'm just like projecting to kind of Nowheresville? Am I recording an album? Am I recording or am I playing to an audience? Um, am I playing for myself? And she's like, no. The important thing about this piece is where you are directing your voice. Um, so just kind of a different sort of highly compressed score. Uh, this is a project that was actually made using Tracery by Emma Winston. Um, this is kind of riffing off of some of those graphical uh, music languages. Uh, it's called Graphical Scores. And uh, she would actually like, generate these using Tracery and then play these in a gallery setting. Um, so a little bit more about cool encodings. Um, these are some neat encodings. Can anybody figure out what these are? Dance steps, yeah. These are, these are court dances of the 18th century, um, where what do you care about in dance? Like, if you do different kinds of dance, so I, do, I used to do swing dancing and ballroom dancing, um, and in swing dancing, it was all about the kind of force that you're applying to the other person and the like, physical forces that are applying to you at any given moment. Um, you know, are you extended? Are you compressing? Um, are you pulling past them? Um, are you like, pressing hands to push away? Um, so I would draw a very different language for that. Um, these are court dances where there's not, it's not about momentum. This is about precisely moving through a space uh, and precisely moving your arms in a space. Um, and they even have like a little like com composable language for that. And I kind of like that like we can also look at these as a programming language using these same tools, of, like saying like, okay, you know, a small change in domain term should be a small change in code terms. So if I wanted to like add a step, I should be able to encode that reasonably in these things without rewriting the whole program. Um, simple things should be simple. Simple things in this court dance might not be things that I would think are simple, um, but they might be like kind of obvious to them. Like what is the, what is the simplicity in this space? Um, so these images are from a book called Choreographics, um, which is by Anne Hutchinson, um, and she worked with one of the early notations. And I realized as I was making this, I think her dress is also Le Bon notation, so that's a program over there over on the left. So I, I appreciate somebody being on their bowl about as much as I usually am. Um, and this is uh, what's called Laban notation. Um, I'm not an expert in it by any means. Um, but we had, oh no, I didn't put your name in here. Um, Mariel uh, from yesterday, who gave the deeply amazing uh, talk on dance, um, she also had uh, Laban notation in her slides. So this is second, second Laban notation in this. So as far as I can tell, not being able to read Laban notation, um, it was described as this is the dance of the little swans. And then I was able to find a video of the dance of the little swans. So I think this is like somehow kind of about encoding uh, that space. So that kind, of mo that kind of movement of like, you know, I have a bunch of people doing this thing is encoded somehow in that. Um, Lava notation is super cool because it's like a compositional language to describe dance. So this is a language to describe a, a space and they still have to like, they still have to make simple things simple and complicated things possible because you might have a choreographer who just like needs to do some really wild stuff. Um, and so you need to have a language where you can like compose interesting pieces together and kind of make new pieces on the fly if you want to say like, okay, like right arm out but more, right arm out but like, you know, with an aggressive gesture, and you could kind of like in some way visually annotate that. You can kind of extend this language as you need to. Um, things to notice about this diagram is um, vertical movements are, uh, so everything is um, shapes, and so vertical things are rectangles, and then things to the side are uh, arrows. Uh, and things upwards are um, 
uh, shaded and things downward are uh, solid color. So yeah, I figure let's, we've got a few moments here. Let's learn some Waba notation and do a quick stretch. Um, so yeah, all right, everybody get limber. We're just gonna do a little bit of physical movement. So this is, this is all that you need to know. We've got, all right, side low, black, or black arrow goes down, side middle, the, the thing with the dot. Yep, there you go, side high, there you go. And then vertical column high. All right, let's try this out. All right, how about that? Yeah, it goes down into the, or, yeah, there we go, it's reversed on me. Uh, so yeah, dark goes down. All right, how about that? There you go, right into the middle. All right, so this is, let's see, up, and then vertical. So this is the easy one, to the sides, there we go. All right, so we got, we haven't seen the symbol yet, but can you guess what the black rectangle means? Remember, black is down. Vertical, so you got that, you got that, and that. There you go. All right, so that one, and then that one. It's hard to do this. All right, and last pair, so we got a that, and then we've got a that. Oh, that. <laughs> okay, here, what about a weird one? Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of dabbing. All right, one last one just to cement it. And, and, and down, yeah, there we go. Congratulations, you've just spelled out strange loop in semaphore. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see languages translating into languages. Uh, so yeah, this was all done by the Dance Notation Board, a group of people who basically sat around together and said like, what is there? What is there and how can we write it down? Which I, I think is just a wonderful philosophical exercise to do. So part three, just the time I've got left, um, ways of knowing, how do we know things? And why is it fun to know things? Like, why is it fun to discover new things? I was a grad student for 10 years, so you can imagine like, exactly how much I enjoy knowing things and figuring out new things. And I, I suspect I will just, despite having gotten my degree, be a grad student for life. Um, so like we said before, languages have a bucket of cognitive tools, um, and we extend those cognitive tools. Uh, as we need to, as we get to more specific use cases. So you can do the same thing with developing a language in general. Um, this is often called ontology. Ontology is the practice of saying what there is in the world and how it's structured. Uh, these are images from a really good book called The Book of Trees, um, which is a history of tree diagrams throughout history. Um, and there's things like you know religious texts, and the one in the center is uh, railroad uh, railroads leaving from New York City. So that's New York City in the bottom, and the like tree of all the places that you can get to New from New York City, and where you would like how they branch out from that tree. Um, so there's a lot of kind of mind expanding tree diagrams in that. Um, but this is just like kind of one way of saying like, oh, I think. Like, of all the things that I could say about railroads, the most important thing I could say about railroads is what is their path back to New York City? Um, you know, or, or what is the, like, you know, of all the things I could say about, like, the Plantagenets, like, the most important thing is which one descended from which other one. Or, you know, nature photography, I really want to say, like, what kinds of nature photography are in which other kinds of buckets. Like, there's, no nat there's no reason that nature photography as a phenomena needs to fit into a diagram. We're kind of sketching a diagram that says, like, this is what's important to me right now. Um, so ontologies are always imperfect and they're always kind of contextual of like what's important to us right now. Uh, it's, it's a tool that we work on. It's, a, it's not, you can definitely have an ontology that's like baked into Wikipedia or an ontology that's baked out to a dictionary, but often they're just like a thing that we're figuring out on the fly. Um, how do we build an ontology? Well, you have a workshop with a bunch of people. This is a stock photo of a workshop that looked just like awful, and I thought I would put that in. Um, but you can also have the one on the left where it's just a group of people asking themselves, what is there? Um, surprisingly, this is fun, or at least it's fun to the sort of people that this is fun to. There's a tautology for you. Um, I actually, during the pandemic, started hosting what I call Evenings of Recreational Ontology. Um, <laughs> if y'all, has anybody in here experienced a, um, a, a, a Google Doc party or Google Sheets party? Um, all right, so Google Sheets Party, there's a great article on Medium uh, about these by Mary Fullstone, who is um, one of the first people who threw one. These are, you get a bunch of people on Zoom, you make a Google Sheet, and people just start filling in the cells however they want. And they make like pixel art. Um, often you make like a page that's called Kitchen, and people will start like dropping food emoji in and like talking about how delicious the cake is. And it's basically pandemic people going absolutely mad um, and enjoying kind of this sort of social activity. Um, but it, we started using it in my research group that was like meeting online uh, to do like 
we, we started actually, this was somebody's birthday uh, uh, spreadsheet party in the top here, um, and somebody made the like, list of all the things that there are. Um, so we had one page of the spreadsheet that was to list all the things that there are and what we know about all the things that there are. And they started making things like, okay, well, what object is there? Uh, what size is it? What is the age? Is it opaque? Is it hot or not? Um, and you know, trying to answer things like that, things for things like a thousand years, um, Skimble Shanks, Emily Bronte, the opacity spreadsheet column, um, a block of Gruyere, and just kind of like coming up with ridiculous answers for each of these as like a fun thing to do at a party. This is like jackbox for extreme nerds. Um, but it's also like really useful to like solve this problem of like what is there to get a bunch of people together and be like, uh, and so I've had these things. I've done them for um, using tarot in procedural content generation. So there's a bunch of us who like do, who are really into tarot and are also into, really into games and procedural content generation. Um, and so we we had one that was just like, okay, what are all the different ways that like generativity and tarot have gone together physically or digitally in the past or in the future? Uh, let us list all the things that there are. Um, I did one for uh, like. Um, kind of procedural content generation getting used in games, like what, or uh, the pleasures of procedural content generation, like why is it fun to use generators? Like when, when generators generate weird stuff, like when Lost Tesla does its thing, why is it fun? And so let, let us list all the ways that that could be fun and like kind of start developing a tree structure or any kind of structure, even words to describe what's going on. Um, one of the words that I came up with um, for doing an ontology of ontologies is cow tools. Um, these are imperfect onto ontological tools of saying like, okay, there's a category of thing. I have a bad name for this thing. Bad names always stick. But like, this is a tool that I'm going to build as like a horrifying prototype that's going to get me to where I need to get cognitively. Um, this is, uh, there's a thing about prototypes. This is from a talk from Heim Gingold, who uh, was the main prototyper on Spore, if anybody played Spore back in the day. Um, I got to work with him a bit on that. He's just a brilliant thinker, but his talk was about how, okay, prototyping, we all know what prototypes are. They're little crappy software, um, but like, what are they really? Um, and so he, he thought, okay, prototypes are actually there to answer a question. You don't build a small prototype because you want to build a small thing, you want to build a miniature version of your software before you build the big version of your software. That's not what they are. What they are is you say like, okay, can React actually do this? Um, if I build this thing in WebRTC, is it going to crash when it gets onto a campus network? Uh, yes. Um, so your answer, you're like, will the user even enjoy pushing this button? Like, in the, in the smallest version of this world, can I make a button that the user wishes to press, even though there's not like all the server architecture that might make them wish to press that button? So you're answering a small question and then throwing that away. It's very much a cow tool. This is a thing that should be weird and awkward and alien, and that's okay. Mostly, I just like making y'all look at that comic. Um, this is another one, uh, a cow tool that I came up with that like ended up sticking was, this is a phrase from our like ontology jam, uh, how do people understand things? And I came up with the awkward term of fitting an octopus into an ontology. Um, so everybody do this quick exercise. Look at the people on either side of you. Uh, one of them is Haskell, one of them is the JavaScript, uh, and one of them is the Fortran. And if neither on, no one on either side of you is the Fortran, then it's you. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is the, the idea behind fitting an octopus in an onto, into an onto, ontology is the, the idea that it's kind of fun to have a broken tool and try to map our world onto a tool that it clearly doesn't want to fit into. Uh, you're trying to fit an octopus into an ontology. Like, what, like octopi don't want to fit anywhere that they don't want to fit, uh, but like it's just hard to categorize this thing, but it's fun to do so. Um, and so you, get, you end up getting these sorts of situations where you have like these, these quizzes of like, oh, well, which platonic solid are you? Like, you have to fit yourself into one of these platonic solids. Um, which one do you feel you most identify with? And there's a bunch of fun variants on those. Um, we'll often kind of start fitting ourselves in this. Um, you can also have ontologies that like, in the diagram of strange to loop, did any of you start immediately trying to figure out where the talks that you had seen or where your talk was going to fit on the, the strange to loop diagram? And did you start wondering like, well, okay, what's in the like, farthest right corner, what's in the, like, what is, is there a talk that is the least strange and least loop at this conference? Uh, hopefully not. Um, and then you can also have things where like, the existence of an empty bucket encourages you to fill it in. And then even if there's not anything that really fits in there, you have to say, well, why isn't there anything that fits in there? So we're, we're understanding the world by an imperfect tool that's not working. Um, so yeah, this is fun for lots of reasons. I want to just kind of skip to the end. Uh, I'm almost there. Um, so my dissertation that I spent 10 years on is on casual creators. This is how to get casual people to be creative. So if you've ever played like Jackbox games with your friends or Pictionary um, or like 
even spiral graphs of just like, okay, here's a, here's a device that is in, like allowing me to be imperfectly creative but supporting me in some AI way. So I did a ton of research on like why those things work. Uh, and often they are like, it's because you don't have to do as much heavy lifting. You don't have to make as many choices. The choices that you're gonna make are gonna be awkward in some way, but that's actually, like if you design it well, that's some of the fun. Um, there's a bunch of other tools that are available to you. So this is, uh, there's things like community tagging, card sorting, a lot of these get used in sort of like normal daily ontology of like, what is our website? Well, I think that our website is, you know, a help page and the like setup page and this. We actually did this exercise in the documentation thing. It was like uh, in the documentation tutorial that was uh, on Thursday, like what is this website? Here are a bunch of things. Figure out the ontology that makes this make sense. And it's gonna have to be imperfect because every ontology is. And every ontology is gonna have to say like, well, this is the way that this website ought to be for a user who's confused and has a question. This is the way the website has to, ought to be for, you know, this is the ontology that makes sense if you're trying to contribute to this thing. If you're trying to contribute to this open source project, my ontology of the world is gonna be wildly different. Um, you also have things like folksonomies. Um, I think probably the greatest, like, there's Wikipedia, but my personal favorite example is AO3. Uh, if you, anybody is into database design or um, folksonomy or wants like basically what, what, what Wikipedia could be through the rabbit hole, this is the site where people write fanfic of different things. Um, and then there's a massive community tagging organization. All the tags, you can scrape all the tags. There's Python downloaders for all the tags. And so it's just people writing millions of fan fictions about different things and then tagging them in different ways and the tags are all kind of semantically linked to each other. So this is, I tried to find one on programming languages and here's one where um, apparently C is dating JavaScript um, <laughs> and they're both non-binary. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, uh, so this is them trying to tag that so you can semantically find the JavaScript fanfic that you want while avoiding the JavaScript fanfics that you don't want. Um, we don't have great tools for collecting this information aside from something like AO3. We don't have general purpose things. It's just like, hey, can I, like, I would love something where I can have an ontology gem and we like get to build trees. Uh, the best I've got is Moreau, but that doesn't scrape the information usefully yet. So uh, this is like a kind of an open question of doing more of that. But yeah, uh, this kind of idea of like, you know, what is it to, to build uh, we can, to learn things, we can build prototypes. Um, we can bro build prototype languages. Um, one of my favorite things when I'm developing things like Chancery is I put myself in the mind of a, some, an author who's writing in this and saying like, okay, I want something where the world is ending and there's one state machine where like different world ending things are happening and you hear them on the radio, but also you're wandering around a house and also you have a relationship with another person. So here are three different like state machines going. And I'll just start type, I will imagine that somebody has written this programming language and I will just start typing as naturally as I can of how I would want to program that. And then I use that to kind of tell myself what ought to be in this language uh, and where it ought to be and like what is common. If I try to write, write this program myself, I'll show myself what's common, what's uncommon in, in a world that doesn't exist yet. Uh, you can also have humans play computers. Um, there's a book called Phil, uh, by Phil Agri called Computation and Human Experience where he talks kind of deeply in, into the philosoph uh, philosophy of building things to know things. He works in AI, so it's like, we all think we know something about AI until we try to build an AI, and then we know very different things about AI and have very different questions. Um, so building things is a way to know the world. So last thought um, before I let y'all go is um, we're gonna contemplate the universe and write an API for it. Not as an exercise, but you know, y'all can do this on your own time. Um, so I, like, I really like to draw, I like to watercolor paint. I'm like, eh, okay at both of them, but it kind of doesn't matter um, because the way that I use these is I, I tend to be very like, a lot of us are like, we, we try to know the world very rapidly. We try to make first impressions. We try to like parse out things rapidly. And this is just like a thing that humans do to be able to deal with the world. It's like, you just say like, okay, there's a building, there's a building, there's a building, there's a coffee shop I wanna go to. And you don't even have to think about those three buildings that you just passed. Um, but if you sit down and like do drawing or painting as a practice, you actually have to like say like, gosh, there's these like super weird little finials on top of this building that I never looked at. Like, wait, no, that piece isn't connected to this other piece. Like, wow, like that stonework is doing some really complicated stuff with how it's fitted together. And you have to like, you know, and if you do this with nature stuff, you're like, oh, a nice blue pond full of green water lilies. Um, dang, there's no blue or green actually anywhere in the scene. You have to like truly look at the scene and like take some time, slow down, see beyond what is expected to be there to what's really there. Um, so I think this is a really nice kind of task of like, what if this is a way to slow down and appreciate and sketch a domain that you're trying to write a program for? Uh, rather than saying, ah, I see that you are attempting to do a coffee shop maintenance 
uh, program, like you need to like do inventory and stuff. I see what you need is like off the shelf number. Th and like honestly, if you just want to get your work done and like give these people a nice stable program to work with, but sometimes it's nice to think of like, okay, well, like I love coffee. Like what is it that I love about coffee and how would I describe that to a computer? So yeah, I kind of just like final thoughts, like building languages to me, and I've done a couple of other terrible languages after Tracery and Chancery that like nobody needs to see, but they're just kind of like my sketches of like, this is too, uh, like this is a form of poetry for me, writing a, writing a program, writing a language, um, where we're trying to sketch a picture of some corner of the universe that we care about, something that we like actually want to sit down and look at. And maybe we didn't even care about it before we started looking at it deeply. Um, but we want to explain it to a computer so that the computer can understand what it is that we care about. Um, so this computer in its imperfect silicon brain can also say, yeah, no, the most important thing about coffee is the relationship of like heat to water and how that's going to alchemically change the beans. And that that's not a momentary process, that is a continual process over time. Um, so yeah, uh, that is the last slide I have, so I'm just... Uh, I was kind of rambly, but there we go. Uh, deeply think about the universe and make an API about it, I guess. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, the question was, how does this work with GPT-3 and how that's going to, like, how, did, how is that going to store its information? Um, GPT-3 and, like, other, other neural nets are really interesting because they, too, have cognitive tools that they use, right? So you have these middle layers, these, uh, this latent space where if I want to auto-encode something, I take my object, I try to fiddle with these weights such that the object goes in, it compresses down to a much smaller space than it was, once was, and then it compresses back out and it's like mostly lossy. So it's this like, what is the latent space that is like lossiest to the things I care about this, in this image? Like what is, what is this neural network encoding of this image that like most captures the things I care about? Um, so it's like useful to me as a cognitive tool in that way of like, okay, this is a way that I could get a computer to be my partner in an ontology jam. Like, why don't you tell me what you think is important from what I've told you? Um, it's also a kind of a target of ontology. Like, what, what do we think is happening in this AI? Um, and we don't yet have the cognitive tools to even be labeling a lot of this stuff yet. So we, we are short on cow tools for machine learning. Um, like, we don't even have poor tools yet to start understanding what's going in. Like, we have very rudimentary cow tools right now where it's just like, okay, we can do some, like, deep dream stuff to, like, try to show ourselves what's going on in these middle layers. Um, but we don't yet have the language that we can use to interpret in the same way that we have, like, you know, I can look at a program and be like, okay, there's a for loop and there's a class and there's a, an if statement and there's a while loop and I can understand, like, I can fit that into my head. I don't have any of those cognitive tools to parse this kind of massive soup of weights. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>